And, uh, we like to start every week by reading a psalm, and here's the deal. Drew's always telling people, you guys come up here, come read the psalm every week. If everyone's interested, talk to me, talk to Drew, talk to Brian, talk to Brad, get up here. We'd love to get you guys involved in the service and read the psalm. But with that being said, we don't have anybody this week, so I'm uh, happy to read the psalm for us this week. If you guys would like to follow along, this week I'm going to be reading um, Psalm 91. So if you guys have Bibles or want to grab one in the back or have it on your phone, Psalm 91 Follow along, and you don't have to, but Psalm 91 says, The one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say concerning the Lord, who is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, he himself will rescue you from the bird trap, from the destructive plague. He will cover you with his feathers. You will take refuge under his wings. His faithfulness will be a protective shield. You will not fear the terror of the night, the arrow that flies by day, the plague that stalks in darkness, or the pestilence that ravages at noon. Though a thousand fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, the pestilence will not reach you. You will only see it with your eyes and witness the punishment of the wicked because you have made the Lord my refuge, the most high, your dwelling place. No harm will come to you. No plague will come near your tent for he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you in all your ways. They will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample on the young lion and the serpent. Because he has his heart set on me, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls out to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and give him honor. I will satisfy him with a long life and show him my salvation. Dear God, thank you for being our protection. Thank you for being our refuge. In times of trouble uh, here on earth, you're the only one who we can look to for support and safety and refuge. Thank you for, for being that for us. Thank you for bringing us through all struggles here. Um, thank you for being the one we can turn to for comfort and for peace in our struggles. You never say life is going to be easy, but you're the person to whom we can turn to get through those struggles. And we know you'll bring us through to the end on all the struggles we have here in life and protect us also in the life to come. Thank you. Help us to look to you in times of trouble and, and not look for other things, but look to you as our source of, of refuge above anything else. It's in your son's name we pray all this. Amen. Thanks, guys. I'm going to bring up Pastor Drew now to get us started. Good morning, Sprite Christian Church. How you doing? Good. You could tell that Brian is a teacher. Uh, follow along, kids. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm glad to be with you guys. I'm Drew, lead pastor here at Surprise Christian Church. Uh, I am so excited for, for today's sermon, so we're just going to jump into it. Matthew chapter 14, we're going to verse 13 today. We started a new series last week titled Kingdom. Kingdom, And we talked all about Jesus and his interaction as he found out uh, John the Baptist had been beheaded by Herod. And we saw this, this terrible picture of an earthly king doing terrible things. But then we saw the more beautiful picture of Jesus and how he uh, approached this situation. This week, we're going to continue that thought. Um, and the main thing we're focusing in on today is this idea that you and I like to establish our own agenda. All right, you and I like to establish our own agenda. And in this way, we kind of set ourselves up as our own king or queen of our days. Now, you folks out here who have kids know how poorly that goes. Uh, since I had little Marcella, I have learned a lesson of life, and that is anything you have planned for the day when you have kids, expect it to be nothing like that once the day actually occurs. <laughs> things change all the time. I, I set out a plan of the things I'm going to do in the day, and it just never works out that way. It just never works out that way. I also try to set plans for things that I have in the future coming up. But if I can't even plan my day-to-day -day well and actually have it work out that way, how well am I going to be able to plan out my future? James talks about this, and, and he says, don't say, hey, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there, but say, Lord willing, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that, I'm going to go here, or I'm going to go there. Because who sets the agenda? God does, right? God sets the agenda. Not just for our day-to-day, -day, but for our weeks, our months, our years, our lives. God sets the agenda. He sets what's going to happen 
And, and so we have to kind of get into that mindset where we recognize that it's God's kingdom. It's God's kingdom, so he sets the agenda. Uh, right away this morning, I, I was reminded of this as I was getting ready to preach. Sharon, who's a member of our church, she works uh, very closely with Valley View Community Food Bank, and she came in this morning and she was sharing with me that they are like completely eradicated of all canned foods. Uh, she came in this week, and the, the thing she was doing is she usually does the cans and organizing them and hands them out to the family. She was telling me that it was one can of vegetables for a family of six because they just didn't have any. And, and Jesse, who's the, the, the one who runs Valley View Community Food Bank, he, he reached out to, to FEMA, he reached out to Walmart, all the stores around him, and all of them said, nope, we can't, we can't help you, can't give you any cans. And so Sharon was, was sharing that with me this morning, and, and we talked about it, and I was like, okay, we want to do something, let's do something. I'm going to actually call Jesse this week and figure out what we can do as a church, because I, I had said uh, weeks ago when we were in our value series that something I want to see is that every week we can be a drop-off location for them. You come to church, you bring a can of food with you, and we drop it off to them during the week. Well, man, didn't the Lord just change my whole agenda this morning and saying, Hey, hey, that thought, that vision, that heart you had, hey, is it, <laughs> there's a need there. And so I'm going to call Jesse this week, but I'm putting this out here, just as the opening of the sermon, totally off the side of what I intended to talk about this morning, just to say, if you have in your heart this week to go by the store and buy as many canned fruits and vegetables as you can and go drop them off there, Valley View Community Food Bank, they could use it. So, so there you go. Throw that in your agenda this week. The Lord changes our plans all the time. He changes our plans all the time. Another way I was reminded of this was during this building process. There was so many times over and over again as we were building this out where I said, hey, we're going to open this day. Oh, nope, that didn't happen. Okay, we're going to open this day. No, 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 that didn't happen. Okay, we're going to open this day. Oh, nope, that didn't happen. Okay, we're going to open this day. Nope, nope, still not going to happen. And the Lord over and over and over again was teaching me, listen, it's my rules. <laughs> you get to trust. I'm going to do this in my timing. I'm going to do this in my way. I think we all struggle with this. We all struggle with setting the agenda. We all struggle with setting the rules. We also all struggle with admitting when we need help. When we have set things up in our lives a certain way, it doesn't work out as planned. It doesn't work out according to schedule. We're drowning in it. And now we need help. Most of the time, our reaction is, hey, I'm going to fix it. <laughs> This is my kingdom. It's my rules. I'm going to jump to action. I'm going to plan it out. I'm going to fix the problem. How often do we go, Lord, maybe you changed the schedule. Maybe you mixed it up. Maybe I'm, I'm not seeing the full picture. Hey, can, are you going to deliver? What, what's your plan in this? What are you working in this? What are you looking for in this? My challenge to us today is to see the need for us to submit our agenda to the kingdom of God instead of our kingdom. So with that being said, let's jump into it. Matthew chapter 14, we pick up in verse 13. This is where we, we kind of ended last weekend. I just want to remind us of where we are context-wise. So John the Baptist has just died. His disciples come to tell Jesus what happens, and it says this. When Jesus heard about it, he withdrew from there by boat to a remote place to be alone. When the crowds heard this, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd had compassion on them and healed their sick. Remember that from last weekend. So this is the follow-up. When evening came, the disciples approached him and said, This place is deserted, and it's already late. Send the crowds away so that they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. So here's, here's the picture, right? Jesus has just found out about the death of John, his family member. We talked about this last week. Jesus describes John as the greatest man who ever lived. He'd just been beheaded as a party favor uh, uh, for Herod at that party. Jesus finds out about this. He draws away to pray, and, and guess what happens? The crowds follow him. They're not letting him get away. You're not going off alone to pray. You're not going off to spend time by yourself. We need you. They follow him, and they follow him in mass. There's a ton of people Jesus interrupts what he's doing. He interrupts that prayer and he goes and he begins to heal and have compassion on this huge crowd. This goes for so long that it goes from daytime to nighttime, right? Jesus is healing these people all day long. And now it's evening. 
And the disciples are looking around and they're saying, this place is a desert, it's a wasteland. There's nowhere for them to go. There's nowhere for them to get food. Send them home so they can go and eat. Our tendency when we read this kind of stuff is to go, come on, disciples. Have a little more faith than that. You know, Jesus is going to do something amazing. But, but isn't this reasonable? <laughs> if you're out in the middle of, of the desert and you have a huge crowd, like imagine we were having a church service and we just decided for some reason to go off in the middle of the 303 over there where it's just, just nothing out there in the wilderness. And we were just out there and, and there was a huge crowd that gathered for whatever reason uh, to, to listen. And we were all hanging out. Wouldn't you say if we had been going all day long, we haven't eaten a thing all day, we're out in the desert, it's a long drive home. Hey, hey, it's time to go home, <laughs> right? We do an hour long church service and it's already like, I'm hungry. Where am I going to go to eat? Uh, you know, it's perfectly reasonable. More than that, there's a chance because it's late and they're out in the wilderness, they have to travel home. There's no street lights, right? There's no flashlights. There's no, you got to go in the dark. And if you've ever gone up north and been out during the night, right, up in Prescott or Flagstaff, and it's just pitch black dark and you can't, you can't see anything, there's, there's wolves and all sorts of other animals out there. It, there's robbers and thieves. There's so many things that these people can run into on the way back home. What the disciples are saying here is perfectly normal and reasonable. Hey, Jesus, it's time to pack it up, buddy. These, these people got to go home. They need food. They need to get home safely before it gets too dark. Verse 16, Jesus picks up. They don't need to go away, Jesus told them. You give them something to eat. I just, <laughs> I picture this scene for a minute of just them looking around at one another, going, um, what did he just say? You give them something. To eat. What are you talking about? Are you crazy? Are you insane? We're, we're out in the middle of the desert. You got to send these people home. What are you talking about? You give them something to eat. What am I going to go do? Go hunting and find, <laughs> find a bunch of animals and cook them and, and bring them here, right? What are you saying to me? You see, the disciples had an agenda and it was the right thing. Hey, it's time for these people to go home. And Jesus says, no, it's not. No, it's not. I've got a different plan. And you're going to be part of it. Verse 17, they respond. But we only have five loaves and two fish here, they said to him. This is the familiar children's ministry story if you grew up in the church, right? You know where this is going. Verse 18, right? Bring them here to me. Don't miss this. We're going to come back and hit it, right? The disciples say, hey, this is all we got. And Jesus says what? Bring them to me. Don't miss that. It's going to be really important. Then he commanded the crowds to sit down on the grass. Can you imagine being in this crowd? You're like, dude, you're crazy. Like, it's late, but they stay. Go and sit down in the grass. I got a plan. He took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them. He broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. Everyone ate and was satisfied. They picked up 12 baskets full of leftover pieces. You might be thinking to yourself, yeah, a couple hundred people. It's already pretty amazing. What happens? Now, those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. This is a huge crowd, right? This is a huge crowd. 5,000 men, assuming most of them are married or, or have kids. You know, you got another three, four, five thousand 5,000 women there. You have all the children, two, three, four, five, six, seven children in a family, right? How many people are here? probably a little over 10,000, probably in that range of people. That's a crazy amount of people, right? And here we have a couple loaves and two fish, and Jesus breaks all of these and spreads it to all these people, and they eat, and they're so full, and yet there are 12 baskets left over. Don't miss that detail. That's going to be important too. I want you to notice this next verse. Verse 22, it says this. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat, and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. Barmy wonders if this is like, all right, I need some time. Y'all go, y'all get in the boat and go over there. You've been driving me nuts. You get on the other side of the boat. I'm staying here with the crowds. I'll figure this out. Anyway, he gets the disciples to get on the boat and leave. After dismissing the crowds, verse 23, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And well into the night, he was there alone. Do you see kind of the connection from the beginning of our story to the end? Where was Jesus when we started? He had gone off alone to pray, right? Where's Jesus when we end? 
he goes off alone to pray. There was an interruption in the middle of his prayer, right? He was there with the father praying, having a conversation alone by himself. He had an intention of why he was there. The crowds follow. He takes a break from that prayer, comes, heals, provides, gives them everything they need. And then where does he go back to? Back to praying. He, he picks off where he left up. He didn't let the interruption bother him. He didn't let it, it change everything. He's going, I'm going back. I, I got to pray. That's where I was. I'm going to do the good. I'm going to go back to praying. That's important to notice. So we have this story, and it's an amazing story, and I want to go through a few details that I think change some things for us in the way we understand it. Here's the first piece of the story that you may not realize or may not have thought about. There's no doubt in my mind that this story is Jesus retelling the story of Israel in the desert. The story of Israel in the desert. Now, you may be familiar with this, you may not be, but, but the Israelite people, right, they're freed from captivity in Egypt. They're brought out in the Exodus. They're out in the wilderness, right? They're out in the desert. There's this huge group of people. They all complain to Moses, who's leading them out. We're starving. We're dying. Why'd you bring us out here? Moses goes to God. What does God do? Manna, right? He gives them manna out from the heavens, and he provides for them every day, just enough for the day, right? So that they have enough to eat, but they continue to trust him through their whole journey through the wilderness, well, why do I think this is a retelling of that story? Where are they right now? They're in the wilderness, right? And they have this huge crowd, right? And the huge crowd needs to do what? They need to eat. And what does Jesus give them? He gives them bread, right? There's bread and there's fish, but what, what does he give them? He gives them bread. It's a retelling of that story where, where Jesus is now Moses in the story right? And he's interceding for the people with God. He prays to God. He blesses the food. He separates out, and there's this amazing miracle where Jesus is feeding the whole crowd out in the wilderness. Well, you may be wondering why this is important, because if he's retelling the story, what were the differences? Did this bread fall out of heaven? No, right? It, it was just common things that were there. The disciples had fish, they had bread. Jesus takes the common thing and he makes it miraculous and he spreads it out to the people. That's going to be important. He takes the common thing and he makes it miraculous and he spreads it out to the people. What else might be different from this story? Does Jesus give them just enough to eat? What does he do? He not only gives them enough to eat, he has what? 12 baskets of leftovers. Now, I'm letting you guys on the uh, Jesus is going to get angry with the disciples in a couple chapters because he's going to do this miracle again in a few weeks when we get there. And they're going to be leftovers again. It'll be a different number, right? And he's talking with the disciples and they just totally miss it. He's like, why in the world would I have made an extra 12 baskets if it wasn't on purpose, right? <laughs> like pay attention to what I'm doing. And, and I don't get this because they can look around, hey, there's 12 of us and there's 12 of these baskets, that's just crazy, right? And there's, there was 12 of the tribes of Israel, and there's 12 of us, and there's 12 of these baskets. And, you know, it's like, okay, I, I'm starting to see what's going on here, right? Jesus is telling a story through this miracle. He's telling the story of the Old Testament in a new light. He is providing in the way that God provided for the Israelites out in the wilderness for this crowd. Here's what else Jesus is doing. And I think this is the most powerful piece of this whole story. Notice here in, in, in this verse, uh, verse 20, or 19, go back to that with me. Then he commanded the crowds to sit down on the grass, and he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them. And I want you to notice this. Pick this up. He broke the loaves and gave to the, uh, gave to the disciples who gave it to the crowds. Now, when you've heard this story before, the thought was probably always, Jesus is multiplying the fish and the bread, right? And he's breaking the fish, and they're multiplying. He's breaking the bread, and they're multiplying. But what does it say, right? He gives them, he gives them the bread and the fish. He blesses it, and then he breaks what? The loaves, right? And he spreads the loaves. Why do I bring this up? Something that's going to happen in a few chapters is communion, right? And, and it's eerily similar, and I want to put that verse up here. Matthew 26, as he comes to the first Lord's Supper. In verse 26, it says this, As they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed, sound familiar? Blessed it, 
and broke it and gave it to the disciples. And he said, what? Take and eat it. This is my body. And he's going to keep going, right, with the juice, or the juice. (laughs) Modern thinking, right, the juice, the wine. This is my blood, right? Could it be possible that describing this in the exact same way is intentional? In other words, Jesus is looking back to the Old Testament, and he's saying, I'm the fulfillment of all that was happening back here. But now I'm doing something different. I'm using common things to bless the people instead of just things that come out of heaven, right? I'm not just giving you enough. I'm giving you more than enough of what you need. And more than that, I'm looking forward to what I'm about to do for all of you. And part of me, I, I, I want you to, to, to hone in on this in this passage. Every time Jesus breaks the bread for the over 10,000 people that are here, there's an image of my body is going to be broken for each and every single one of you. Jesus could have just been like, boom, here's a bunch of loaves and fish, eat, right? He could have done it. If you can break off bread and make it multiply for 10,000 people, you can just go, here's some bread, right? Or he could have gone, Lord, rain it down from heaven. Give us some manna, right? (laughs) Show us just like he did in Israel. He takes the time to break off every single piece for every single person gathered at this gathering. And every time he's breaking the bread, and it's the symbol that he gives to the disciples, this is my body broken for you. I can almost see it in the, in the miracle itself as he's blessing it. Him saying, this is my body broken for you. 10,000 times to all of these individual people. This is an amazing, miraculous, wonderful moment that happens right in the midst of the schedule that Jesus had set for himself. He was praying and he returns to praying. So let's bring this into to our world for a second. Let's bring this into the real into the real world, and I shouldn't say the real world, into our lives for a minute. There's so much we can learn from this passage, but here's the thing that I want us to grab most of all. You can go ahead and put up that lesson for disciple. I'm putting on the slide guy here. We can't give the world the kingdom it needs. Jesus can. We can't give the world the kingdom it needs. Jesus can. And where am I drawing? There's this moment where the disciples are looking around and they're operating off of the way that we think in the world. Hey, it's time for these people to go home. Hey, we only have this much. We can't go much further than that. We got a couple loaves, a couple fish. We can't feed them. They're thinking day to day, the way that they live, the way that they think. Jesus is thinking kingdom, right? Jesus is just in the prayer with the Father and now he's gonna move and do this amazing miracle that draws in the past, brings in the future. There's this amazing plan. The disciples are missing it. And it's perfectly reasonable for them to miss it. But notice what Jesus does here. They come to him and they say, this is all we have. What's Jesus' response? Bring them here to me. Let me say something to you this morning. You are the disciples in this story. You are the disciples in this story. And I believe that all of you have a heart and a desire to see God's kingdom be brought into the world. But the problem is we often think about our ways, our agenda, our ways of accomplishing what we think is God's vision, right? I'm going to lay out this plan, and it could be a great plan, right? It could be a wonderful plan. It could be a plan that blesses so many people around you, and you're laying it out, and you're saying, this is what we're going to do. But if it isn't God's plan, right, it isn't going to happen. And and the disciples here, they have their way thinking they've laid out this this plan. These people got to go home. Jesus has a kingdom plan, and we have to be reminded, man, sometimes we got to say, Lord, this is all I got, and it's not enough. This is all I got, and it's not enough. All I've got, in fact, in this case, it's so not enough. (laughs) You know, a couple fish and a couple of loaves of bread for 10,000 plus people. It's so radically not enough that they may have despaired entirely. There's just no way this is going to happen, right? But Jesus jumps in and says what? Bring them to me. One of the things, man, that happens in my life all the time as a pastor is 
is I also have fears and failures and trials and, and hurts. And there's so many times where I pray to God and I say, listen, this pastor thing, I, you picked the wrong guy. <laughs> you just picked the wrong guy. You picked the wrong guy in the wrong time. You need someone else to, to do this kind of stuff because I'm just not it. And, and so many times the Lord has just said to me, stop it and bring them to me. Right? Who are you to think that you are the one that's needed? Right? That I have to use you to bring these people to me. No, no, no. You got to get it right. You are messed up. You don't got enough. You don't have what it takes. In fact, you're so radically far away from giving the people what they need. You're over here with just your little fish and your little loaves, and you're saying, I'm going to feed them. I got to figure it out. But Lord, I don't got enough, right? And he's just saying, Stop it. Bring them to me. This, this is my kingdom, not yours. This is my agenda, not yours. This is my plan, not yours. And I've decided to use you, so bring them to me. Right? Because notice the next part. They, they, the disciples doubt. They bring them to him, and then he says, could he have just done this himself? Just hand it off one at a time? Yeah. What does he do? He breaks it. He hands it to the disciples. He adds a middleman, right? And then they bring it to the people. Was that necessary? No, but what is he doing? He's including them in the miracle. He's bringing them into the kingdom. That's you and me. When we're able to admit to God in prayer, I don't got what it takes. I don't got the skills, the talents, the ability, the giftedness, whatever else, the faithfulness, the trust. I, I, I fear too much. I have too much anxiety. I, I, I just have all these problems in my life. What are we doing? Well, I'm the king. I got to figure this out, God. And you picked the wrong guy. If I would have just had more of this stuff, I would have figured this out. And God's like, exactly right. And then you would have thought you didn't need me because you got to figure it out. And he's teaching us this lesson. I want to use you. But the only way that's going to happen is if you're able to say, Lord, I don't have enough. And you're able to heal the call. Bring them to me. And then he's going to use you. He's going to use you. And he's going to use you in miraculous, wonderful, world-changing, God-blessing ways. But you got to get past the, I'm setting the agenda. I, I'm, I'm the interviewer for my, my role in the kingdom, right? I'm both the interviewer and the employee, you know? I, I, don't, I don't see the qualifications in you, sir. I'm sorry. You're going to have to go find another place to, to work, right? I, I do that to myself all the time. Well, why does that matter? Because God's the one in charge. So how do we bring this out? Let's give a couple application points from this, from this story. How do we live this truth out? Here's the first one. We have to recognize that the kingdom doesn't work on our schedule. The kingdom doesn't work on our schedule. You can't box it in. You can't plan it out. You can't tell God what to do, when to do it. It just doesn't work that way. It doesn't work on our schedule. And the more you fight against this truth, that the kingdom doesn't work on your schedule, the more distance you'll have between you and God's will for your life. Because the more you do of, I'm going to do it, I'm going to figure it out, I'm going to schedule it out, I'm going to plan it out, and you remove God from the picture. Which kingdom are you serving? Yours, right? And you might say afterwards, but look, it's good stuff, <laughs> right? Yeah, I set the agenda, but look, Jesus, I, I mean, I'm, I went to the food bank and I served for a couple hours. Yeah, I set it up, but, but you know, I know you were calling me to do this over here instead, but, but look, this is good too, right? We got to get it out of our mind that the kingdom works on our schedule. No, it doesn't. This is something that's talked about in scripture over and over and over and over again. People were complaining to the disciples in the first century saying, hey, I thought you said Jesus was returning soon. I thought you said it was urgent. I thought you said he was coming right away. Be ready, be prepared. Where is he at? And at one point, Peter says, a thousand years are like a day to the Lord, and a day like a thousand years. What you consider late or not showing up is God's patience, not wanting any of you to perish, but all inher to inherit eternal life, right? My plans are bigger than yours, and my timing is bigger than yours, right? The kingdom doesn't work on our schedule. Here's another point we can draw from this. We have to recognize we don't have what it takes so that we will bring them to Jesus. We have to recognize that we don't have what it takes so that we will bring them to Jesus. The problem with believing that you can solve the problem, you can help, you can jump in, you can do it, apart from Jesus, is you become the Savior. You become the Savior. You become the Savior in your own life. You become the Savior in the lives of the people you're trying to help. But let me tell you, you're a terrible Savior. 
You can't even save yourself. That's how bad you are at it. Okay? You're just the worst savior. You really are. You're just a mess. You just, you can't do it. The more things you try to fix, the more you break. The more things you try to help, the more you hurt. You're just a bad savior. It's time to recognize that so that you can go to the one who's actually a good one. So you can say, man, these people need Jesus and I'm getting in the way. Here's the next thing. We have to hear Jesus' invitation to be used by him to bring the kingdom. There's a heart here where Jesus could have just done it himself, but he chooses to use the broken, struggling, with trust, in some ways, faithless disciples, right? And he includes them in it. Now, it might be just some simple little thing, like, go oh, hand out the food, right? <laughs> like, you can be the waiter for me, you know? And we might look at that as like, well, that's not a very glorious job, but can we be the ones to break the loaves? I mean, that'd be pretty cool. I mean, <laughs> you know? But he includes them in the miracle. So often, guys, we miss the way that God is including us in his plan to bring the kingdom because we're looking to be a part of something more important. All right? We're looking to be a part of something more important. We're looking to have a role that people will recognize. We're looking to have a kingdom. I want some praise. I want some glory. I want a little shine. I want want people to notice, right? There's so often that God isn't raining down manna from heaven. He's separating the loaves and the fish, the things that we have every day, and giving us more than we could ever ask for. But we just don't realize it because we're looking for that huge miracle to come and hit us in the head. You're right? God, if you would just raise somebody from the dead, then I believe, right? That kind of stuff. That kind of stuff. Never mind, hey, man, I prayed for years and years and years to have a kid, right? We prayed as a couple, and we struggled for years and years and years, and then we finally did. And now the kid's here. It's awesome. It's great. But I never went back to the Lord to say thank you. In fact, I'm complaining. Where's the second one? (laughs) Right? So often we look for God to do the miraculous, but then we're, we're looking for something so huge and so big that we miss the fact that he's doing things all the time with the loaves and the fish and asking you to be a part of it, and you're just ignoring him. Because you got your own agenda. You got your own agenda. Let's get to the next thing. We have to learn to trust in God's provision. We have to learn to trust in God's provision. I talked about this last weekend. It's this amazing prayer that I said Jesus was praying on the island by himself after John dies. Well, guess what? I think not only was he praying it there, but he's praying it on the way back when he goes by himself and he sends disciples across the sea. Let me remind you of what it is. It's Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, and it says this. I'll let you get there. Sorry. Jesus tells the disciples, therefore you should pray like this, our Father in heaven. Notice Jesus blessing the food, our Father in heaven, right? Your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Notice the next line, folks. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Well, what's the next piece of this prayer that's being fulfilled? Right in live action. And I mean, he hits us right over the head with it, right? Give us our our daily bread. Well, here's me giving everybody their daily bread, right? We can't miss it. Jesus is going to the Father before praying the Lord's Prayer. He's going to the Father after praying the Lord's Prayer. That's my belief, because that's how he teaches us to pray. And I believe that when he goes to pray the Father, he's not just going, hey, you guys pray like this, but I'm going over here. I got my own, I got my own prayer, secret prayer here. No, he's laying out, this is how prayer is supposed to be. And Jesus prays, give us this day our daily bread. The disciples, when they go to Jesus in fear of not being able to provide for the people, send them home. Get them home. They're missing the trust and the provision, right? They're missing the trust and the provision. Jesus knows the Father's going to give us what we need. What we're doing here in healing and providing deliverance and bringing the kingdom to the people is more important than them eating some food tonight for dinner. And so if I'm doing the more important work, God's definitely going to do the lesser work of giving them something to eat, right? Right? Why would God cast a demon out of this guy, right? Alan, I'm going to pick on you for a second. Let's say you have a demon, but, you know, musicians, you never know, really, honestly. Uh, (laughs) 
But if the Lord, if, if Alan was possessed and the Lord came and, and he healed Alan, and then Alan was out there all day in the heat and he's starving. He goes, sorry, buddy, figure it out. I, I know I just cast that demon out of you, but I mean, if you die from food you know, or exhaustion, it, that's your problem, right? Good luck. Find your way home. Okay, obviously, why would he spend this whole day healing this whole crowd, delivering this whole crowd? And I go, okay, figure out your way home. You, you get, get killed by a robber. Good luck. You know, have fun. Disciples were missing the picture. God was going to provide. He was doing the greater. Why wouldn't he do the lesser? We're called to trust and pray this prayer, not just so that we can mimic it and just, just read it out, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven, blah, 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 but actually mean it, right? Give us this day our daily bread. What does that say? I trust you to give me everything I need for today. And that's all I need, right? And that's all I need. You're gonna give me enough. If we don't do that, if we don't trust in God for his provision, we're going to miss out on being part of serving the world as part of the kingdom. We just are. You just are. Because you're not allowing God to move in there and say, hey, I'm going to do something miraculous. I'm going to provide for you and provide for these people. Let's get to the last one. We'll get out of here. We must recognize that prayer is how we bring the kingdom to the world. When Jesus is grieving, he does what? He goes and prays by himself. Jesus spends a whole day healing, providing. Where does he go? Back to prayer. The bad and the good, right? Uh, tragedy and loss, I'm going to pray. Good things, miracles, God deliverance, wonderful things. I'm going to pray because prayer is what brings the kingdom. I have to challenge you folks, and I think we sometimes get this messed up in our theology in the way that we think. So let me just say this, and if you have a problem with it, come talk to me. But I believe this 100%. If you pray for things, things don't happen. If you don't go to God and pray and say, Lord, I need this, or these people need this, or Lord, deliver. Not even just, I, I hate that I even just said that. Not even just, Lord, give me, give me, give me, but Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done, right? It isn't about me. It isn't even about them. You do your will. If we're not doing that, things don't happen because we don't pray. You can't keep expecting God to deliver things in your life, to bring healing in your life, to bring, bring good things in your life, demanding that he does it, and then never even think to pray at all. And then just being mad afterwards. Why aren't you doing this for me? Why aren't you doing that for me? Why aren't you doing this for me? Why aren't you even asking? right? You want to know why you're not asking? You're too proud to ask. You're too proud to ask. You are. Think about it for just a minute. When you get in trouble in your life, how hard is it to tell a friend, man, I'm struggling? How hard is it to tell somebody that you need help? How hard is it to go to somebody and admit that you have weakness? You want me to tell you why you don't pray? You don't pray because you're too proud. And let me say this just loud and clear for you. If you don't pray at all, my friends, you're in trouble. Your pride issue is so big. It's so huge. You made a golden statue of yourself like Nebuchadnezzar, and you're saying, God, this is my kingdom. If you don't pray, you're your own king. I just lay it out there. If you don't pray, you have no relationship with God at all. Prayer is how the kingdom comes. Prayer is where you go and you submit yourself. You get on your hands and your knees and you say, Lord, I'm just a servant in this kingdom. You rule, you reign, your will, your timing. Right? Folks, this amazing miracle, I want you to recognize something in it. I know what I'm saying is, is, is harsh in many ways and it's to my own heart too. But I said this last week and, and it's the last thing I want to leave with you here. There is a better kingdom ruled by a better king, right? Jesus spends the time to break off every piece. This is my body that was broken. This is my body that we broken. This is my body that we broken, right? He takes the time, spends a whole day healing every single person in the crowd. He heals. He provides for every single one. Don't tell me that Jesus' heart is in for every single one of those people. He's a better king. And he can do amazing things. You just got to get out of your own way. 
it's time to raise that white flag and say, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. Let mine be nothing. Pray with me. Holy Father, as we gather in your name this morning, Lord Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, Help remind us how small we are. Lord, for your kingdom is not just earth. Forget that. There's billions and billions of galaxies and stars. And they're nothing but in the palm of your hand. Lord, you tell the winds and the waves where to go. You tell the sun to rise and to set. You tell the earth to spin. God, you set the galaxies in motion and you hold them together. Lord, how small are we in our kingdoms? Help us realize today, not only are you so big and so great and so powerful, but you are also right there with us, loving us, choosing us, dying for us, bringing us into your kingdom. Lord, help remind us that you love us. And it's time, Lord, that we gave up our kingdom for a better kingdom ruled by a better king. Lord, you're an awesome God. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.